This is a tribute to the Carry On films. The Carry On films are regarded as a British institution. With their bawdy humour and their sexual innuendos, the films would pack cinemas nationwide. Between 1958 and 1992, 31 Carry On films were produced. The first being that of Carry On Sergeant. Our story starts in 1958, when a story by R. F. Delderfield called The Ball Boys about two dancers doing their national service became the premise for a comedy film. Peter Rogers and Gerald Thomas got hold of Delderfield's script for The Ball Boys and gave it to Norman Hudis to turn it into a comedy. Carry On producer, Peter Rogers. The first film was called Carry On Sergeant. It came about because it was a, uh, an outline, story outline going around written by R.F. Delderfield. And it was about uh, conscription and it became Carry On Sergeant. And I had then under contract a scriptwriter called Norman Hewlis, and we got together and I said, let's make fun of it. If you've never been doubled up before, if you've never lost your breath laughing, we warn you it could happen now. Get your hair cut in the morning. As you watch a bunch of physical jerks, a proper shower of misbegotten misfits who never miss a trick. Cameraman Alan Hume. I never forget on Carry On Sergeant, which was a bit of bit of a shambles because our guys couldn't couldn't march, couldn't stand to attention, couldn't do anything military. But in no time at all, dear old Gerald and the sergeant major we got from the army, uh, they knocked these boys into shape and they really started to enjoy it. Here we are, chaps. Help yourself. Thank you. I wonder where Charlie's got to. With his wife, of course. Love will find a way. Look here, mate. You don't really think that that woman's on this camp, do you? I tell you, it's just an hallucination, we know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, you can laugh. We should never have let him go. Are you a regular? No, national service. Here, yeah, what about your training? Don't do it anymore. Haven't done it for uh, months. Oh, I don't want to try again. Again? How many courses have you been through? Three, I think. But now it... Look. There's me excuse webbing shit, me excuse marching shit, excused handling of firearms shit, shit for... Blimey, you're just an heap of chits. Scriptwriter Norman Hudis. We have carried the characters forward into my conception of the typically British situation where a bunch of incompetents, resentful of being in the army at all, I mean, where's the war? Everybody's gone home. Well, all of you are half asleep. Like a lot of flamingos. Not half as clever. Flamingos go to sleep on one leg. You lot are all asleep on two. How many legs does a flamingo go to sleep on? Um, slow, slow. Quick, quick, sir. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Alert mind plus responsive body equals efficient soldier. Who are you? Galloway, sir. That's a useless answer. Two factors omitted, number and rank. Soldier without a number and rank, like a man without a soul. Try again, who are you? 4277309, Private Galloway, sir. What, no Christian name, you heathen? Andy. A. Slow, watch this man, Sergeant. Slow with it. Stand at height. John. At ease. John. At ease. John. At ease. John. Still in dreamland. You dream? Yes, sir. What about? Blood. Whose? Mine. Timorous spirit of aggression he's rising here, Sergeant. You should dream of the enemy's blood. Now then, close your eyes. What's the first thing comes into your head? Blood. Who's? Yours. Fine. What? Uh, my mind, sir. The Yemenis. Indecisive. Try sleeping on your stomach. Proper rest plus graded exercise equals integrated instincts. Who are you? 4277312, Private Sage C, sir. Now say it backwards. Uh, uh, oh, come, on, come on, come on, come on. 312737... Uh, three, three, if you can't think backwards, eight. how do you expect to think the proper way? Watch this man, Sergeant. Rigid mental processes achieve flexibility. Flexibility plus discipline equals common initiative. It does, sir? Uh, I mean, it does, sir. It does, yes. You? Yes. It, what? Who are you? James Bailey, BSc Economics. Your number? I'm not proud of it. It was given to me. I earned my degree. Your rank? Well, that's a matter of opinion. We didn't know it was going to be a big success. We made it here. And it was the... It broke the ice in Pinewood, which was regarded as a very expensive studio. We broke the ice 
proving that you could make a very modest budget picture in Pine because it only cost 90 odd, 70 something thousand. Isn't it? I think the distributors, once they saw the, the money pouring in and so on, said clearly we have to do another one. With the success of Carry On Sergeant, more followed in quick succession, mainly focusing on what was the hot topic in the news at the time, such as the NHS or the police force. By this time, a well established cast had been assembled and many of the regular faces would become household names, such as Kenneth Williams, Charles Hawtrey, Joan Sims, Hattie Jakes, Kenneth Connor, Shirley Eaton and Leslie Phillips. Many would go on to appear in many more of the films. However, not everyone was happy of being typecast as a carry on Leslie Phillips. Wherever I go, people come up and say, oh, say, you know, say ding dong. I go, ding dong. I go, Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Tom Potter, nothing hotter. I mean, really. <laughs> I'm doing Shakespeare and Chekhov now. I only did three, which is quite extraordinary. Everybody thought I did 103. My personality is so powerful, I suppose. But I just said to Peter Rogers who and Jerry Thomas, I, I said, look, I do want to move on. I don't want to do any more. In 1962, the sixth carry-on film went into production, this being the first also to be shot in colour, as a team embarked on the Mediterranean cruise of a lifetime in carry-on cruising. Here we are just about to set sail on another cruise. For ten years we've run this ship together, steadily increasing our reputation as the most efficient crew afloat. Who are you? Your first officer, sir. You're not. Foxton is. What's happened to Foxton? Is he ill? What's he got? Eight drawers, sir. I should be so sick. <laughs> Who are you? Marjorie, Baba. Ship's doctor. Impossible. Not impossible at all. I have certificates to prove it, have I not? I'm certified, I am. You look it. It's all very unsettling. It's very unsettling. All these changes may be on my back. Your pardon? My back, my back. Probably overdoing it, eh? <laughs> I'll massage your clavicles. You will not. Now then, where was I? Uh, you were getting straight to the point, sir. Oh, yes, yes. Now then, if this voyage turns out to be as successful as all the others we've made together, don't be surprised if after our return I ask each and every one of you to join hey, me. Hey, excuse, you... excuse me, excuse me, I wonder if you could direct me to the kitchen. I'm new, you see, I'm sorry to interrupt you and all that, but I've been all over the boat. Ship. Oh, ship boat, who cares as long as it floats. <laughs> now, I've been down the sharp end, I've been down the blunt end, and I've been down as far as it's possible to go. But I, I'll keep on finishing up ankle deep in all this mucky water. Bilge. Oh, no need to be rude. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Well, make a wild guess. <laughs> <laughs> but for one of the lead stars, the stardom got too much, and a replacement was brought in at the 12th hour, Lance Percival. And along came um, uh, Carry On Cruising, and I got a part as a barman uh, for £35 a week, I think. I don't know. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Uh, I got a part as a barman, which I was very grateful for. And something happened with Charles Hawtrey. At the time... Um, they had an argument of some sort, I don't know what it was, but anyway, Charles Hawtrey wasn't in the film, so they upgraded me suddenly from barman to chef. Peter Rogers. The most important member of the cast was the title Carry On. I would not let anybody go above it. The trade press at the time said there's another Carry On being made, and if it didn't have Charlie Hawtrey in it, it wouldn't be worth seeing. Or worse to that effect, and of course, this went to Charlie's head a bit, and he not only, through his agent, asked for a lot more money, but he wanted to be the star, and a star, believe it or not, on his dressing room door. Some of the cast was expecting to go abroad on a ship. Sadly, Peter Rogers assembled a liner in Stage B at Pinewood Studios, full of all the rigging from a normal ship. But one actress, though, had issues when it came to filming some of the scenes in the swimming pool. Liz Fraser. Well, that was quite funny, because I can't swim. And when we were supposed to be swimming in the pool, I said uh, to Gerald, I can't swim. And he said, well, you've got to do something in the pool. <laughs> so I did some sort of backstroke. Oh. Oh. I could never do that. You are now serving as ordinary seamen aboard His Majesty's frigate Venus, bound for distant parts as yet unknown. Excuse me, did you say Venus? Yes, Venus. 
<laughs> That's all right, then I've got nothing to worry about. You won't think that when I've done with you, mister. No, but don't you see, sir, this is the ship I was supposed to join. I'm a midshipman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. You're a midshipman. That's right, midshipman poop decker. That's very interesting. <laughs> Would you tell me something else, friend? Well, of course, sir. Anything at all for you, sir. Who is that up there, then? Let me see now. Uh, um, uh, is it Nelson? No, he's got too many arms. Is it Nelson? He's got too many arms. I think you'll have to tell me, sir. Who is it? Midshipman Albert Poopdecker, RN. Is it really? Do you know, I'd never believe you get two people. The most ambitious carry on was to set Sal. Carry on Jack went into production in 1963. Two new actors were brought in to strengthen the cast, as many of the regulars were absent. Bernard Cribbins. It was the first costume drama as such, um, and in colour. I think they spent another 12 quid on that one, um, at least. I enjoyed it, I must say. Being my first one, I didn't know quite what was going to happen. Juliet Mills. I was very honoured to be asked to be in a carry-on, I can tell you. Something down! Everybody wanted to do one because uh, everybody knew how much fun it was going to be. <laughs> I remember getting the script and then getting to the midship, <laughs> the midshipman outfit, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be hilarious with these, you know, with me dressed up as a boy. Who is that up there then? Is it Nelson? No, he's got too many arms. <laughs> the uniform, it was very authentic. Tight white breeches, uh, which got tighter as, as the film progressed because I was actually uh, three months pregnant when I started the film. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody in case they it frightened them and they fired me or something. Whilst the team wasn't as big as normal, with many regulars missing from Carry On Jack, the next Carry On film would be in the same vein as the team sent up the James Bond films. Um, how do I look? Oh, smashing, yeah, you look ever so nice. Good. Will you help me on with mine, please? Of course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'd better just put it in your handbag, Dustin. All right, men, if you're ready. Oh, no. Oh, Mr. Simpkins, I hope you don't have to do much walking. Because You're not supposed to wear it down there. No. You'll do yourself a mischief. Yes. It's supposed to be up here. See? All ready to get off a slick draw like that, you see? Oh, so make these things the right way round. Oh, Mr. Simpkins, that was wonderful. I'm sure I'll never get my jaws off as slickly as that. <laughs> Peter Rogers. I was threatened with uh, a writ if I used double O anything. The lawyers came on in a fussy way and I said, oh, don't be silly, what's it all about? Harry Saltzman and Cubby Broccoli had just made Dr. No and uh, we were talking downstairs and uh, they were talking about the success of Carry Ons and Harry said to Cubby, I think we might make a comedy. I said, I thought you had, and they were furious. The films at this point were bringing in the crowds, and with the success of the film Cleopatra, it seemed inevitable that the Carry On team could send up the Roman Empire. Throughout all history, the immortal love story of Cleopatra and Mark Antony has fired the imagination of men. Many magnificent motion pictures have been dedicated to their illustrious names. Now comes the most provocative, the most daring, the most shocking of them all. Hail, Mark Anthony. Hail, snow, sleet, thunder, lightning, the lot. Julius in? <coughs> I see he is. It's all right for some people. Well, I'm busy trying to wage a war. He's busy trying to make a peace. Mark Anthony, sir. Julie. Tony. Hello, I've caught you with your toga up. I was just soaking my feet. They're so cold, I can't seem to get them warm. Well, you've been wearing these open-toed sandals again. No, it's not that. It's this filthy disease I've caught. It's some local thing. It's called a stinking cold. Oh, mm. yeah, well, never mind. Go on, carry on. Don't mind me. Get him in again. Thank you. How's that? All right. Oh, much better. And how goes the conquest of Britain? You know something? I just don't get these Britons at all. Huh? Every time we get a decent punch-up started, some geezer behind their line shouts, tear up! 
and they all disappear. Tea up. Oh, very odd. It must be one of these strange gods they worship, like this other one they're always talking about, Crumpet. What's that again? Crumpet. I don't understand it at all. No. You know something, I don't think they want to be conquered. I know what you mean. Apathetic. That's the word. But we didn't have any trouble in Spain and Gaul. We slayed them there. I don't know why we bother with this lot. Look at these lovely straight roads I've built for them. They don't even bother to use them. They don't even bother. Same with the baths. I tell you, this country is a dead loss. Oh, always so cold and damp. You wouldn't think it. This is supposed to be the season of the golden breezes. More like the season of the brazen monkeys. For Jim Dowell, this would be his first big role in a carry-on. As previously, his roles were just mere cameos. Jim would go on to film a further five to add to his three other appearances, making him a familiar face in the films. Jim Dow. Kenneth um, used anything to, to get a laugh. Kenneth was always wicked um, on, on, on screen. And there was one section of Cleo where they're fighting in a bath of milk. And Kenneth is backing me into a corner. And as we moved into the corner during the rehearsal, he pushed himself up against me. And we rehearsed. I said, don't do that. And he put, I said, now stop it. Jerry, I will not have this. And I stopped the rehearsal. He said, what's the matter? I said, Kenneth is not behaving as a, a leading actor should. Ken said, oh, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Sorry, it was an accident. I said, it wasn't an accident. You were doing it for 30 seconds all that, so don't do it again. Carry on producer, Peter Rogers. Then there was an occasion when Kenneth Williams fell down the back of a flat on the floor. And, and we sent him to along to the nurse. And he was gone a long time. <laughs> I said to Gerald, I'd better go and see where he's got to. Well, this nurse, I must tell you, bless her heart, you couldn't have had a more unattractive geese if you found one. And there was Kenneth Williams lying on the table. And I said, come on, Kenneth, that's enough. And he came back. my squaw to fetch the peace pipe. <coughs> You'd care for a piece of pipe, wouldn't you? Be glad that, Chief. Once talk peace with the Sioux, but you can't trust them. One minute it was peace on, the next peace off. Looky up over there. Engines. What? Engines. What, you mean railway <laughs> engines? Red engines. Them smoke signals. What do they mean? Dang if I know. Oh, I can tell you. I bought a useful phrase book in Washington. Now, smoke signals. Ah, oh, here it is. Now, what are they saying? Puff, 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 puff. Ah, here it is. Please direct me to the ladies' or gentlemen's cloakroom. Jim Dow. The back lot of Pinewood had never looked more Western than it did with that set. It was absolutely brilliant. Annie Oakley was trying to teach me how to fire a gun, and Jerry said, well, you know, just play about. And I said, it would be nice if we could do some really tricky rehearsed stuff in this. So I spent two weeks watching myself pull a gun out, letting go of it. The gun would spin in the air and I would reach for it, hoping I was going to catch the barrel. I would be rehearsing for hours a day. And so when you see this, ad lib of me pulling the gun, it spins twice, I grab it and the barrel's pointing at me. <laughs> that was two weeks of practice, but it was worth it just for the two seconds that it took of screen time, because it, it, I, I, it looked wonderful. young and we're not too old why wait for fate to give you a shove when i am yours to have and to hold this is the night for love angela douglas i got the telephone call and they said look we'd really like you to play annie oakley so i thought oh is that Annie Get Your Gun? <laughs> you know, is that a musical? Am, am I up for this? Anyway, it turned out to be a film called Carry On Cowboy and would I play Annie Oakley? And yes, please, I'd love to. Well, the singing scene 
was a, a very nerve-wracking experience. I said to Joan Sims, I terrified, knees were knocking, so she gave me a double brandy. She gave me a double brandy and she pushed me up those stairs and she pushed me on. And I think you can see in the very last shot I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm embarrassed at the end when I get to Sid and I'm so relieved it's all over. Never be another night like this And so hold me close Till daylight is near Closer than a hand in a glove And say those words I'm longing to hear This is the night for holding me tight for this is the night for love by 1966 the carry-ons had made 12 films but sadly the 12th film could have been the last as head of anglo algamated ended its deal with the carry-ons explained that they wasn't going anywhere and the company wanted to progress in other directions Carry On Screaming, a spoof of the ham horrors, would be that potential last film. Sid James wasn't available and was replaced by Steptoe and Son actor Harry H. Culver in his only Carry On film, Jim Dow. I think Harry felt a little bit out of it. We all had the confidence of, of having worked with each other for over the years that we didn't really have to um, involve ourselves in too much rehearsal. We knew what was coming. Harry perhaps felt a little bit on the outside, but, you know, the arms of the company were around him every day, and finally he did relax and become part of it, and uh, really did enjoy making that film, he told me afterwards. The noise! Huh? What's that huh? noise? 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 Well, it's only the telephone bell! Aren't you ever going to get used to it? I'll never get used to it! The invention of the devil, that's what it is! People talking through wires, waking respectable people at all hours! It's like someone's walking in when you're in the bath! Huh? It's an invasion of privacy, that's what it is. You in a bath, that'd stop any invasion, that would. Well, I'm not having it in my house a moment longer, do you hear? And if it doesn't go, I will. I can promise you that. Promises, promises, always promises. Slow bottom here, Sergeant. I'm sorry if I'm disturbing you and Mrs Bung. That's all right, slow bottom. We weren't doing anything. I thought you ought to know, Sergeant. It's happened again. What's happened again? Another disappearance, Sergeant. Move over. What did you say? Move over to my side of the bed. Certainly not. You're not getting round me like that, Sydney Bung. Oh, please, Em. Just this once. I've only got a few minutes. Up! <laughs> I'll say this for you. You make a very good trouser press. You're not going out. No, I'm putting these on to take a bath. And where do you think you're going at this time of night? To find another woman. Don't lie to me. You're going to that wretched police station of yours, I know. Oh, you've caught me out. Huh. You haven't any time for me, let alone any other woman. I would bet on that. Police, police, police. That's all you ever think about. Never mind about me. Oh, dear, no. Do you realise you haven't taken me out for years? I oh, don't exaggerate. We went out a couple of months ago. Had a lovely time. You call that lovely? To my poor dear mother's funeral? Well, I enjoyed it. The success of the films at this point got interest from other distributors, and the rank organisation was keen on taking them on. However, they wanted to test the water first, and so the next two films would be made without the carry-on prefix. The first, Don't Lose Your Head, a send-up of the French Revolution, and second, Follow That Camel, that starred one of the most expensive guest stars in carry-on history. Bill Silvers. What am I doing here in the middle of the Sahara? Well, it isn't actually, you see. We're out here in Canberra making, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation. You British people do have some weird names. I think it's Canberra. And we're making a picture called Follow That Camel in which, in the most original fashion, I play a sergeant. Something new to me. A sergeant in the Foreign Legion. And the name of the picture is Follow That Camel. And I'm the only American in it, and possibly the best actor of the bunch. Baby, how about giving us the dance of the two veils? You mean seven veils? Why bother with the preliminaries, eh? <laughs> hey, did you see that? She's crazy about me. She's very beautiful. But, but why was she wearing that ruby in her... Well, in here. That's to keep the draft out. 
I don't know if you happen to notice, sir, but uh, these things... Uh, uh, y yes, Simpson, I, I did happen to notice. Well, we had some casserole dishes just like that at home, sir. Oh, yes, that's right. We used to put our dumplings in them. They use them for the same reason here. Peter Rogers. You had a camel on carry-on, follow that camel, that wouldn't walk on sand. We couldn't get the bugger to walk on sand. So we had to put this metal stuff underneath and then uh, put sand on top of it. And then he walked on it. The success of these two films were well received by not only the public, but the distributor. And the carry-on title was re-added to every other carry-on film that would go under the rank organisation. <laughs> Next time... We continue our story as we hit the swinging 60s and the sensational 70s as we delve into camping life, dating, Henry VIII, package holidays and toilets. Until next time, carry on.